question required for uh, uh, Roop sir, but uh, nevertheless, uh, he's a professor in uh, Institute of Economic Growth since 2002. Uh, he was last the dean uh, of uh, dean uh, uh, in the uh, department of economics in the South Asian University, and uh, he was also the director general of uh, Nillard, Government of India. His research uh, interests include the issues in development, urbanization, labor, corruption, industrialization, and productivity, services sector, gender inequality, etc. So uh, we welcome you, sir, uh, and uh, we we will be looking forward for your session. Uh, Thank you. To hear you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, so as I mentioned, I like to focus on growth, total factor productivity growth and employment, because I thought if I'm not covering the employment aspect, the story will be incomplete. So uh, let me start with the concept of uh, factor productivity and total factor productivity. Um, as you know, that factor productivity uh, will be uh, defined as the value added uh, per uh, labor, let's say that's your labor productivity or value added per capital is your capital productivity. But the problem with uh, interpreting the factor productivity is as follows, that uh, if you have um, pursued uh, capital accumulation, and if you are adopting a very capital intensive technology, then naturally labor productivity will be increasing very rapidly. But that does not necessarily mean that every laborer is contributing at a, a higher pace uh, compared to the past. So factor productivity um, analysis can be faulty at times. So from that point of view, it is important to deal with uh, the productivity issue from the angle of total factor productivity. In other words, it would be defined as the um, change in uh, the rate of change in output relative to the uh, rate of change in all inputs. So if you have a two input function, the value added function, so the rate of growth in value added minus the weighted average of the rate of growth in capital and labor. So that is what uh, it would mean. So you are trying to account for all the factors of production which are engaged in the process of production. And then to what extent uh, resources are being utilized more efficiently will get reflected in terms of total factor productivity. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you uh, yes. uh, press F5 so that the activity is in the slideshow mode? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, in the literature, we get to see that total factor productivity growth has been defined in terms of technological progress or technological regress, plus the change in technical efficiency. Uh, so it is a flow concept. So when I'm using total factor productivity growth, it is a flow concept. So it is referring to uh, the advancement in technology that may have taken place, or there might have been a deterioration in the, uh, in the technology uh, level. Uh, so that is being captured through technological progress or technological regress, plus the change in technical efficiency. Here, I think the point is very interesting that an advancement in technological progress does not necessarily mean that uh, a firm has been able to exploit that technology optimally. In other words, the new advancement may have uh, been realized, but the firm might have been operating much below the uh, maximum attainable level of output. Or the farm might have been quite efficient in the previous regime, uh, let's say when the, the older technology was uh, given, but with new technology, the farm is not able to move towards the frontier. So the technology, the technical efficiency, the change in technical efficiency can be negative in spite of having a positive technological progress. Okay, so the the addition of technological progress and the change in technical efficiency can actually be um, sort of uh, negative. It's possible to have that suppose a change in technical efficiency, uh, let's say earlier it was 80% uh, and now it is 40%. Uh, so there is a decline in the change in technical efficiency. So the, uh, the outcome uh, of such a decline in uh, technical efficiency level can result in negative total factor productivity growth or whatever the positive technological progress has been realized can be neutralized 
by a change, negative change in technical efficiency. So the notion of total factor productivity is interpreted as an index of all those factors other than labor and capital, not explicitly accounted for, but which contribute to the generation of output. Okay, so basically you can uh, address the issue of total factor productivity index uh, through two different methods. One is the output method and the other is the value added method. So if you are adopting the output method, then the total factor productivity growth will be defined as the rate of growth in output minus the rate of, rate of growth in uh, all the inputs, the average rate of growth in all the inputs. But if you are considering the uh, value added function, so then it is the difference between the rate of growth in value added minus the weighted average of the rate of growth in capital and labor. Now, uh, I thought, uh, let me highlight uh, this analytical frame uh, when we are uh, in the backdrop of economic growth. Non-resource driven growth is the key to sustainable development in the long run. Um, because uh, if you are using up your uh, resources, uh, in, there can be serious trade off between your present uh, utilization and future utilization. Technological advancement is endemic to economic growth. So that enables you to um, have greater returns for the uh, usage of same uh, magnitudes of resources. So growth in output, which is more than proportionate uh, increase in inputs is attributed to total factor productivity growth after controlling for returns to scale. So we have to make a distinction between the increasing returns to scale and the total factor productivity growth. So if the farm is in the initial stages of production, it is quite possible that it may be realizing the increasing returns to scale. But total factor productivity growth is a concept which is net of these uh, returns to scale. So usually what we do, we assume that there is constant returns to scale or we try to uh, impose this restriction of constant returns to scale and then try to see that what is the um, uh, net gain in terms of uh, um, learning by doing, et cetera. So the endogenous growth models can be relooked to identify the major determinants of the non-resource driven part of growth. So suppose, you are decomposing the growth in terms of uh, two uh, components. So let's say one is resource uh, driven growth and the other is resource, uh, um, uh, resource saving growth. Uh, so how much of the resource saving growth uh, is contributing to the overall growth is, is the key point. And our, uh, in the, particularly in the context of a developing economy, the whole purpose is to maximize this non-resource driven growth or the resource saving growth, okay? So if you are using up your resources, then there is no big deal in, uh, in realizing a higher rate of growth. So when we are uh, posing this question that the um, determinants uh, of, uh, of growth need to be identified so that the policy um, initiatives can be introduced, we are also posing this question that what are the determinants of your non-resource driven growth or resource saving growth so that uh, uh, total factor productivity growth can be realized or the policies can be introduced to uh, reap benefits in terms of higher total factor productivity growth. So endogenous growth models urge that research and development expenditure uh, taken as a broad proxy for innovative moves contribute directly to firms productivity enhancement and indirectly through their industry wide spillover effects. So uh, basically one is trying to um, lay emphasis on the innovative activities of the firms and also the macro policies to what extent encourage such innovative activities. Now, <clears throat> um, when uh, you sort of decompose growth in terms of uh, resource saving and resource driven um, growth, then you can see that this, re this research and development or innovative activities are directly connected to this resource saving uh, growth. Uh, similarly, import of technology and FDI can also result in technological advancement contributing to TFPG, because the idea is that the imported technology will uh, allow you to use the resources more economically. And similarly, when foreign direct investment flows in, it comes with technology uh, as a package. And uh, with the implementation of that new technology, there would be a lot of positive spillover effects 
um, there would be a lot of ancillarization and there would be a lot of positive spillover effects to the uh, neighborhood, both spatially as well as in terms of uh, the backward and forward linkages to other industries which are connected to the main industry. And hence that will enable firms to uh, reap benefits in terms of higher total factor productivity growth. In the light of Kuznets modern economic growth, we understand while the developing countries may be catching up with the developing with the developed countries by investing in factors contributing to productivity and growth, the gap must be maintained. The developing countries will be about to catch up with the developed nations, but they should the developed nations should not allow the developing countries to catch up. So there lies the fact that the developed nations have a greater responsibility in realizing higher and higher levels of total factor productivity growth. And that will come primarily through your technological advancement or technical progress. Uh, so that the, uh, the advanced nations will, or the developed nations will always be much ahead of the developing, uh, developing countries. When the developed countries are able to pursue technological progress in a continuous manner, translating into shifts in higher levels of productivity is, is, is very, very crucial. So to what extent the technological progress will actually contribute to higher levels of productivity is a quick question because uh, in, the, in the recent past, it has been seen that technological progress has taken place, but not necessarily it is resulting in higher levels of productivity. So we need to understand those reasons as well. At the global level, TFPG has witnessed a deceleration in the recent past. It has happened both in the developed world as well as in the developing countries. The emerging economies were expected to have a very rapid uh, total factor productivity growth, but unfortunately they are not able to experience that. So the productivity decline is indicative of poor performance, both from the point of view of the developed as well as developing countries. Investment growth has slowed down in both developed and developed in developing countries with implications on innovation, skills, and infrastructure. So many firms are not able to pursue innovative activities just to get uh, tax benefits. They show in terms of uh, pen and paper that they have undertaken. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the genuine innovative activities has slowed down. Uh, you can um, evaluate it in terms of uh, the new patents that the Indian firms have uh, received or the firms from the developing countries have received. Similarly, there is a shortage in skill, shortage in infrastructure. So one is indirectly trying to suggest that these are the main determinants of uh, total factor productivity growth or the um, uh, non-resource driven growth component. And uh, the technological progress among the leaders has decelerated while the developing countries are not in a position to experience a productivity surge. So uh, as I was mentioning that it was the responsibility of the developed nations to um, pursue greater innovative activities and they were expected to remain as the leaders. Um, but unfortunately that has not happened uh, because of many factors. Even when factor input contributions remained relatively strong, TFP declines occurred in the um, emerging market economies. So the emerging markets uh, economies were also not able to experience uh, uh, acceleration in the TFPG growth. So the worldwide TFPG growth has decelerated. The contribution of I ICT has reached a saturation point. So there is a belief that the ICT boom has al already occurred and uh, therefore uh, there is no further advancement uh, to TFPG growth. Uh, here one is trying to argue that uh, ICT and the technological advancement, they are connected. Uh, in fact, they are the uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. And since ICT advancement has reached a saturation point, so technological advancement, further technological advancements is also not possible. So from that point of view, um, the uh, researchers are arguing that we have to wait for another ICT boom to take place. Uh, uh, and that perhaps will result in, a, in further technological progress and that may contribute to the 
total factor productivity growth uh, uh, in the coming years. Uh, also, there is a view that you need to decompose the capital in terms of tangible capital and intangible capital. So some people believe that in the developed nations, the intangible capital cost is going up enormously, particularly the, the countries which are innovating technology, they are investing a lot of resources. And when they sell this technology to the other countries, even within the developed world, um, a huge cost is involved. As a result of this increase in intangible capital cost, the total factor productivity growth has been pretty low. Though the labor share is on the decline, the share of intangible capital is on the rise and the globalization process with its consequent effect on value chain has possibly resulted in productivity declines in the developed countries without commensurate increase in productivity growth in the developing countries as their growth is resource in. The developing countries are pursuing resource intensive growth, not really the resource saving growth. And on the other hand, in the developed world, your share of intangible capital and the cost of intangible capital is going up enormously. So these are the two major reasons for which uh, the total factor productivity growth has been very sluggish at the international level. The cost of knowledge workers using ICT might have been on the rise, reducing the TFPG. So it is not just the physical capital and it is not just the production workers, rather the, the cost of knowledge workers that is also increasing very rapidly and that may have resulted in a decline in the on the other hand, a number of reasons are cited to suggest that new technology can still create new employment opportunities. So here, let me draw your attention to a fact that uh, there are many, many economists, both in the developed world as well as in the developing countries, including the work of Asimoglu and, uh, and uh, Piaka, Pianta. Uh, we, the work tries to suggest that uh, this sort of rise in total this sort of rise in technological advancement may result in uh, higher levels of total factor productivity growth in the uh, coming years, even if it has reached a saturation point at the moment. And in the future years, when new technology will come with greater degrees of mechanization, it may hamper uh, your employment creation. It, uh, it may contribute to total factor productivity growth, but it may uh, happen at the cost of employment. So even in some of the European countries, uh, Piaka, Pianta, they have uh, used uh, uh, the data set for Italy, France, and uh, many other uh, Western European nations. And they are also of the view that the new technology, uh, the, industry, the fourth industrial revolution is going to have tremendous impact on, to, on your employment levels, even if total factor productivity growth will increase. So from that point of view, obviously uh, the major concern comes up, particularly in the context of the developing countries, that how do we experience rapid productivity growth, but at the same time, we do not make any compromise with the employment levels. So in this context, we were really tried to suggest uh, six important uh, points. And he's uh, optimistic and uh, he tries to suggest that uh, perhaps uh, um, this fourth industrial revolution uh, may not actually offset employment. Labor saving effects of technology can be offset through addition uh, of uh, employment intensive industries um, or the industries which actually uh, will be producing new machines, they will be engaging labor to some extent. So if such industries will be coming up on a large scale, then the employment can be shifted to those industries which will be manufacturing new machines. Also higher demand for goods and services due to lower prices. So his point is that if technological advancement will take place, if, um, um, if productivity will rise, so with same amount of resources, you will be able to produce more goods and services, which may uh, reduce the prices. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, demand uh, can uh, more demand can be created for those products. Uh, perhaps the uh, export market can expand. Uh, so new investments uh, can be made using extra profits. 
So if the market expands and if the profitability goes up, then the new investments can be made. Uh, decreases in wages resulting from, uh, uh, from price adjustment mechanisms. So the, if the productivity is uh, increasing, if the product price will come down, there can also be a, a commensurate uh, decrease in the wages, in the real wages. And that will again uh, contribute to the profitability of the firms and the firms may expand their um, investment. Uh, higher income resulting from redistribution of innovation gains. Uh, innovation gains may uh, result in uh, a different type of income distribution and uh, that can lead to a uh, lot of new investment. New products can be created with a new technology. So those new products will also engage labor to some extent. And as a result, not necessarily the employment will be declining. Maybe in the parent company, the employment levels will come down, but because of the scale effect, because of the new investment will be coming up, because of the new products will be, which will be manufactured, employment can be employment losses can be compensated for so uh, the only determinant of loss uh, why uh, the rate of return on capital follows a diminishing pattern so therefore the technological advancement is seen to be the key to uh, higher levels of economic growth so when uh, one tries to endogenize the TFPG in terms of, uh, by identifying the determinants of total factor productivity growth, one is obviously referring to the endogenous growth theory. So uh, Rogers uh, argue endogenous growth model is unlike the neoclassical model where there is no prediction of a long run steady state and hence there is no immediate suggestion that countries with lower output per capita should grow faster. So when we, we are ex extrapolating this argument, we will try to say that countries which are at lower levels of total factor productivity should be able to experience higher levels of total factor productivity growth, and hence they will be able to catch up with the uh, other nations. In the endogenous growth theory, uh, um, Arrow talked about modeling technical change. He considered technical change as the result of learning by doing, where doing refers to the process of investment rather than the process of producing output. So more and more investment uh, will uh, give you greater experience and hence you will be able to utilize the resources economically. With the same amount of resources, you will know how to uh, get uh, greater returns. He used the link between growth of knowledge and cumulative level of investment to model the rate of technical change that could affect the economic growth of a country. So on the one hand, uh, one is talking about the technical change and the repeated investment. He viewed investment as causing changes in the environment which would stimulate learning. Um, other uh, other knowledge-based endogenous growth models, uh, for example, the limit, uh, the imitation model is derived from the work by uh, Barrow and Salai Martin. The imitation model is used to explain positive long-run growth and allows for costs in transferring knowledge. Um, in uh, Romer's work, another influential knowledge-based endogenous growth theory, it, it is described that the growth of technological progress of a firm can be thought of as depending on the level of resource devoted to research as well as the existing level of knowledge the firm has access to. So in the literature, though you get to see that uh, the foreign direct investment, the infrastructure endowment that the government is able to create are um, identified as the determinants of total factor productivity growth, it is equally important to realize that to what extent the firms are able to conduct their research and development uh, activities. So innovative activities and the macro policies which support the innovative activities of the firms are crucial for TFPG growth. Sir, uh, can you use the slideshow now? Yes, yes, yes. 
in uh, Sena's work, um, he is uh, sort of tries to summarize uh, the important fi findings. A firm with low research and development expenditure can draw uh, from the high tech technology from a zero cost, and therefore the high tech firms' um, innovative efforts may explain other firms' productivity growth. His argument is that not necessarily all the firms have to undertake research and development expenditures. If some of the firms in a nation are able to conduct uh, innovative activities, then the, re the rest of the firms can actually benefit. So his, his idea is that many firms are uh, connected through backward and forward linkages. So the productivity spillover effects can be extremely large. The same argument is also given in the context of FDI, that it, uh, let's say FDI is taking place in the automobile industry, so it will come with new technology, and uh, that will have a lot of spillover effects into the other uh, industries that are connected to the main automobile industry. Nadiri found a positive and strong relationship between R&D and the growth of output or total factor productivity growth. So I'm trying to basically suggest that there is a mixed literature. One class of literature will suggest a very strong and positive relationship between the innovative activities, at least of a group of firms and the total factor productivity growth. On the other hand, many people have dismissed uh, this fact that R&D is not really important. Yeah, R&D is a sort of vague concept. And uh, even without much R&D, people are able to uh, experience higher levels of total factor productivity growth, particularly when the state is very effective in providing infrastructure, in improving the employability of the uh, labor force. The channels of diffusion of spillovers vary considerably. They may take the form of intra and inter-industry relationships. So when we are talking about uh, spillover uh, effects of te technological advancement from one industry to another. It can happen um, uh, both across industries and also within a major class of industries. Uh, the other subcategories can also experience rapid productivity growth. Interdependence between public and private sector investment. So here one is talking about the public-private partnership, particularly when um, uh, some of the innovative activities are, um, are financed by the um, uh, state uh, or the infrastructure is created with the initiative taken by the state and subsequently the private sector joins. That also contributes to the um, uh, total factor productivity growth. Supplier and purchaser uh, connections, to what extent the new technology, the ICT particularly, is able to connect the supplier and purchaser. So the ICT is not representing just the technological aspect. It is also uh, a mechanism which, uh, which would bring together the suppliers and the purchasers. And then the geographic location. So here, the, uh, the entire literature on your agglomeration economies will, uh, can be summarized. The urbanization economies and the localization economies um, uh, which will, uh, which are uh, usually recognized as agglomeration benefits uh, are, are important determinants of your total factor productivity growth. And also the domestic firms and firms in other countries through international technology market, trade and multinational enterprises. So the, the FDI, the role of FDI I have, I have already mentioned and to what extent the technology market is very transparent is a key question. And to what extent the domestic firms and the, are able to purchase the uh, new technology at a reasonable rate is, is also very important. So if the domestic firms are uh, able to purchase uh, the uh, new technology uh, at a reasonable price, then uh, the innovative activities are in, the, in the domestic economies uh, can uh, still be very low and the firms will be able to experience higher levels of productivity. Uh, now, before I move on to the key findings uh, in this context, let me um, uh, tell you very briefly about these geographical locational advantages. Uh, here, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one is trying to talk about two types of economies, the urbanization economies and the localization economies. The urbanization economies would mean that uh, the uh, concentration of different types of activities in one particular location will result in higher levels of productivity growth because the information cost can be shared, the labor turnover cost can be reduced, 
So uh, different industries engaged in different activities will benefit from this, uh, uh, this uh, concentration. On the other hand, the localization economies, uh, the literature on localization economies will try to suggest that forms manufacturing, one particular type of goods must come and locate in one space so that they are able to access the technology in a better manner. They are able to uh, reduce the effective price of technology, uh, which is being uh, bought from a, a foreign firm. Um, and also they will be able to utilize the infrastructure more effectively. So firms uh, uh, which are manufacturing similar products must come and invest in one particular space. So from that point of view, each city must specialize in the production of each good. And then like nations, each city should start trading with each other. And uh, that would essentially mean that uh, um, every city will be in equilibrium and every city will be able to utilize the technology that it is, it is using uh, for the uh, production of a particular good optimally. Uh, city A may be um, specializing in the production of X and city B may be specializing in the production of Y. And uh, let's say one is capital intensive good and another is labor intensive good. So the argument uh, that Henderson tries to offer here is that the city which is specializing in a capital intensive good uh, will create more space because the productivity gains will be much faster in this case. And it will be able to create more uh, space for other firms and hence the uh, concentration and the size of the city will also grow to a large extent. So uh, uh, one particular city is large because it is, it is specializing in the production of a capital intensive good. On the other hand, the city which is specializing in the production of a labor intensive good, there the productivity gains which will be much uh, uh, slower and hence um, uh, uh, the amount of space that they will be able to create for other firms and other individuals to move in will be limited and hence that city will remain small. Also, uh, Henderson tries to argue that uh, within a given um, in, uh, economy, of course, you cannot identify one city being uh, highly capital intensive and another city being labor intensive. The factors can be uh, moved uh, freely. So therefore you cannot argue that one, uh, like in case of international trade, you suggest that one country is uh, capital rich and another country is labor rich. So that, that sort of argument is not uh, possible to uh, put forward. On the other hand, what he tries to what he tries to argue that each city has a, uh, requires different types of info, inputs to begin with. That means one particular city might have created lot of infrastructure, which means it is more capital using. So a more capital using city must house capital intensive goods, and hence the productivity gains will be faster, and those productivity gains will be utilized more equitably. That is what he's trying to argue. On the other hand, the city which, is, which has used less capital and more labor must house the labor intensive goods. So in that, in, in that sense, uh, it will be more balanced and it, it, uh, it may not create more space for larger concentration to happen, but it will be able to utilize the resources optimally. Now, as far as some of the key findings are concerned from some of these studies, we get to see that uh, uh, the, uh, the paper based on the uh, on United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO data, panel data, uh, makes an attempt to estimate total factor productivity growth. So we have considered, uh, this is an unpublished paper, um, so the, here, uh, me and my co-author, uh, Samir Malik, uh, we have tried to estimate total factor productivity growth for different countries, both in the developed uh, world as well as in the developing uh, world. And then we try to see the productivity convergence over time, uh, whether it is happening across uh, the globe or it is happening uh, within certain regions. So we try to 
estimate the productivity for different regions in the world, and we try to see whether convergence is taking place. Of course, we try to see it in terms of sigma convergence as well as beta convergence. In terms of efficiency estimates for select years, most of the countries are seen to be below the frontier. Um, this is uh, one key finding that on the one hand, we are saying that uh, total that uh, technological advancement is very fast. At least it has uh, happened in the past years. Now it may have reached a saturation point and we may still be waiting for another uh, technological advancement or technological boom or ICT boom to take place. But uh, before uh, this, it has already reached uh, the climax. And relative to that climax, the resource utilization level is very, very poor. That means there is a huge gap between the maximum attainable level of output and the observed level of output. A number of countries registered either a negative or a positive, but low correlation between labor productivity growth and efficiency growth. So this particular um, uh, exercise tries to tell you that how factor productivity and total factor productivity growth can be very different. And therefore, uh, if we are trying to draw lessons from labor productivity growth, that can be very, very misleading. If there are instances when factor productivity and total factor productivity are strongly connected, then I think the conclusions that you draw either by studying the uh, factor productivity or by studying the total factor productivity growth will converge. But if both of them are having very slow, very low correlation or a negative correlation, which we are able to see in the recent past, then I think the conclusions are going to be very different. So uh, then from panel data regression, the impact of technology uh, is on employment is seen to be negligible. So this is uh, one, uh, one light of optimism that uh, we are able to see that the uh, fear is that the new technology may reduce your employment significantly, but except I think in some of the developing countries, we are not able to um, see a huge uh, adverse impact of technology on employment. Of course, one limitation of the study is that uh, we are conceptualizing technology in terms of TFTG growth. So the, out the outcome of technology is being envisaged in terms of total factor productivity growth. And hence, uh, it is difficult to, uh, uh, to uh, conceptualize technology. Uh, it, it is perhaps easier to take TFPG as a proxy for technology. Of course, in addition to TFPG, we have considered the patent that the firms uh, have received. So uh, this will be the structure of our presentation. I talk about the analytical frame, which I have already mentioned, then TFPG measurement, convergence of TFPG, um, sigma convergence, uh, then labor productivity and TFPG association, impact of technology on employment. Using the UNIDO data across uh, 132 countries uh, for the period between 1990 to 2010, uh, we have tried to estimate the TFPG as well as technical efficiency. Uh, let me add at this point that if you have pure time series data, then you will be able to estimate total factor productivity growth. You may, uh, I mean, the easiest method is your growth accounting method. So you take the rate of growth in value added, and uh, on the other hand, you take the rate of growth in capital and rate of growth in labor. You combine the rate of growth in capital and rate of growth in labor in terms of there by using the capital share and labor share as weights. So uh, you will be presuming that there is constant returns to scale. So mm, the implication is that the share of capital and share of labor would add up to one. So you use uh, those shares as the weights and then you estimate the total factor productivity growth. Alternately, uh, with the help of time series data, you can also apply a regression method. So you let's say you are having a Cobb Douglas production function. So you regress log of value added on log of capital and log of labor and you introduce a trend variable. And uh, while estimating this equation, you pose a restriction that the coefficient of uh, log of capital and the coefficient of log of labor would add up to one. 
So that means you are presuming that there is constant returns to scale. So under this restricted estimation, the coefficient of t, that is time train, will give you the total factor productivity growth. Suppose it is 0 0.025. So basically it is 2.25, um, no, sorry, point, uh, 2.5. Okay, that is the uh, total factor productivity growth per annum. On the other hand, if you have pure cross-sectional data, uh, you do not have time series data, just at a given point in time, you have uh, um, data for a large number of countries. You have uh, factor inputs and you also have the output or value added. <clears throat> then you can essentially presume that the technology is same across the countries. Particularly in the backdrop of globalization, this does not appear to be an unrealistic assumption. You can argue that uh, techno once uh, the technology is inno innovated in a given in a particular country, it can quickly be disseminated to the rest of the countries. So technological dissemination has taken place. Now you are trying to see, given the level of technology, which country is able to experience how much of uh, 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 is able to um, to exploit the technology to what extent. In other words, which country is closer to the frontier and which countries are much uh, below the frontier. So the, essentially you can um, presume that the production frontier estimation can be impl uh, implemented. Of course, here you have two approaches to follow. One is your data envelopment analysis by um, taking recourse to programming method. You try to create an envelope and then you try to see which country is located where in relation to that envelope. Alternately, you can apply the statistical stochastic fu uh, function framework, frontier function framework. And in that framework, uh, you will apply a frontier estimation. So instead of giving a regress command, you are giving a frontier command. So which is trying to um, uh, envisage um, a frontier and it would assume that all the countries are below that frontier. So no country will be able to bypass that, that frontier. Okay, so the difference between the actual level of production and the maximum at level level of output for a given level of input is measured uh, uh, by, uh, by imp imposing a, a positive distribution or, on the error term. You have a standard error term that is your, uh, which follows all the classical assumptions, let's say V. In addition to that, you are saying that there is an uh, additional error term which will follow a positive distribution a half normal distribution or a gamma distribution or an exponential distribution. So this particular error term, additional error term U, let us say, other than V, <coughs> follows a positive distribution and it suppresses all the countries to lie below the frontier. So it is not really possible for any country to cross that frontier. And then one can, for each country, then one can measure the distance between the uh, actual level of production and the maximum attainable level of output or the uh, output that is located at the front at the frontier so then one could uh, see, uh, consider the best performer as the uh, as a uh, hundred percent efficient and relative to uh, that country the rest of the countries can be ranked the percentage uh, to what extent they are efficient that can be calculated. Uh, so the study also examines the relationship between TFPG and labor productivity growth in order to throw light on the dampening effect of TFPG that is taking place and why labor productivity is growing in spite of a decline in total factor productivity growth that needs to be highlighted. So the effect of technology perceived through changes in total factor productivity growth or technical efficiency and the number of patents on employment comprises an, uh, another important dimension of the paper. Um, anyway, uh, so I was basically referring to two types of data that if you have pure time series data, you are able to estimate total factor productivity growth. If you are having pure cross-sectional data, then you can estimate only technical efficiency. Okay, which is only a component of your total factor productivity. Okay, to what extent you are able to exploit that technology. But suppose you have panel data, 
um, across countries over time or across forms uh, over time. So then you will be able to decompose the total factor productivity growth, or you will be able to estimate total factor productivity growth by combining two items separately. One is the extent of, uh, of technological progress uh, over time, and the um, other component would relate to the change in technical efficiency. So <clears throat> the technological progress may be common for the entire world, for all the countries, but the, uh, the extent of change in technical efficiency or the difference in uh, technical efficiency over time across countries can be very different. So you have one component which is difference in difference and the other may be a fixed component across all the countries. So information on patent and per capita income is taken from the World Bank data set and rest of the data uh, we have taken uh, from UNIDO. Uh, and uh, we have converted into constant prices by considering the figures in international currency based on the average exchange rate prevailing over this period. And then deflating the figures by the country specific implicit price deflator. The methodology adopted to estimate TFPG and TE from panel data is due to Conwell, Smith, and Sickles, where they are conceptualizing a frontier production function. And that frontier production function um, will uh, uh, decompose the TFPG in terms of technological progress and the change in technical efficiency. So you can estimate technical efficiency and also you can estimate uh, change in technical efficiency. And then when you combine the technological progress with the change in technical efficiency, you get the total factor productivity growth. So from the production function estimated on the basis of panel data, the coefficient of time trend is taken as the pace of technological progress or regress. If it is positive, it is technological progress. And if it is negative, it is technological regress. The pattern suggests that quite a few countries, many of which belong to the developed world, experienced a rise in TFPG in the 2000s while they had recorded either a negative or a low TFPG in the 90s. So when you are comparing the TFPG estimates, particularly in the developed world, you could see that there was a surge in, in TFPG um, in the later years compared to the 90s. I don't know if this uh, table will be uh, visible. Uh, so we have tried to uh, by, uh, prepare a bivariate table based on the productivity performance during the 90s and the productivity performance during the 2000s. So we have uh, the average uh, productivity growth uh, for different countries. Uh, first, we have the annual productivity growth. And then from the annual productivity growth, we are um, estimating the average productivity growth for uh, over that entire period. And then for two different sub periods for the 90s and for the 2000s. And then we are trying to prepare a bivariate table, trying to see which countries are there in the leading diagonal. So there are many countries which were in experiencing very negative or very low uh, total factor productivity growth during the 90s. But uh, many of them now move, in the 2000s moved into the uh, size classes uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, higher uh, productivity. Also, uh, it is possible to see that uh, the reverse has taken place, but th those cases are, are, are few. Uh, and some of them have remained uh, in, in that low productivity regime, particularly some of the African countries, and also Middle East uh, countries, even East Asian countries, they have remained, they have uh, continued to experience very sluggish uh, productivity growth, both in the 90s and in the 2000s. So here, uh, we are trying to um, uh, consider the annual TFPG growth rates and um, based on year to year TFPG estimates. And then we are trying to see if there is any convergence uh, that is taking place. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the sigma convergence, uh, so if we take all the countries together from the developed as well as the developing countries, 
then uh, there was a decline um, around 2002, 3, 4, and then there was a slight increase to, uh, uh, after 2008, particularly uh, after the financial crisis, you get to see that there is a slight increase in the uh, in, uh, or uh, divergence is, is rather rather taking place. Okay. Now, in case of uh, least developed countries, where there are several ups and downs, but uh, over the uh, that entire period, it is difficult to say that whether there was any stigma convergence or divergence. In the case of low income countries. Uh, again, you get to see that uh, in 2000, 2002, particularly 98 to 2002, there your um, uh, sort of uh, divergence had uh, taken place a lot. And then uh, it, it has been, uh, but uh, it declined, but then again it increased um, and it, it's, uh, it's sort of fluctuating. Only in the case of lower middle income countries, you can say that perhaps in in spite of these, these ups and downs, there, are, there, there is a uh, long run declining trend. Okay. If I take the average uh, values, then perhaps there is a long run declining trend. So that means the convergence is taking place among the lower middle income countries. In the upper middle income countries, again, uh, uh, you can see that there is a, no, almost an inverted, uh, sorry, there is an U-shaped Curve, almost. If you just uh, ignore this hump, this this particular um, this particular hump, then otherwise you can say that there is a U-shaped relationship um, between convergence seems to have taken place. Yeah, then this is your high-income countries. In the high income countries, uh, well, there was a decline, sharp decline, and it remained uh, quite stable. And then again, uh, the divergence is taking place. To in East Asia and Pacific, in a very different pattern, there was a decline, but then thereafter it has increased. Only in Europe and Central Asia, again, you can see that there is a mild declining trend. So divergence is declining, rather convergence is happening. Here, Latin America and Caribbean, uh, again, you are able to see that, uh, uh, that uh, divergence has declined. Uh, here, in case of North Africa, this is your uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, no, there is no clear cut pattern, rather a U-shaped uh, relationship. <clears throat> South Asia, of course, we had many data gaps, so this is not a, a continuous uh, line. Um, there was a decline, but then again, there is some evidence that uh, towards the end of 2010, it was slightly going up. sub saharan Africa, initially it increased and thereafter it has declined. So we are able to see that within regions, there is some bit of uh, convergence taking place or divergence is declining. So that means productivity is catching up uh, with, uh, within a given region. So if one country is able to prosper, is able to uh, experience uh, a rapid productivity growth, then the neighboring countries are able to catch up with that countries, but not really um, uh, uh, worldwide. Convergence uh, is, is not very much distinct. So based on the year-to-year -year estimates, the cross-sectional variations are measured after dividing the countries into various income groups. And from the results for all countries combined, a significant decline is evident in the standard deviation of the FPG estimates, which may be interpreted as a sign of sigma convergence. But as I mentioned, that this particular um, sigma convergence is more uh, prominent in case of certain regions than uh, what we are able to see at the uh, global level. At the global level, the tendency is very, very mild. So on the whole, in several regions in the world, there is a tendency of productivity convergence, though the value around which countries in each region are converging may itself vary from region to region. 
So this could be attributed to a greater degree of association of countries in a given region, pursuing efforts jointly for infrastructural development, ICT coverage and advancement, trade negotiations, technology acquisition and innovation and inflow of FDI. So when FDI is flowing into a particular country, it is not aiming at one given, at one country, rather it is aiming at the entire region. So that could be the reason that why uh, it, is, it is enabling countries in the neighborhood to catch up with, with TFPG. Uh, similarly, ICT coverage and advancement is also enabling the neighboring countries to catch up with the TFPG. So there has been a productivity decline uh, in terms of TFPG across the globe since the advanced countries are not able to raise it steadily, while many developing countries are not able to exploit the productivity advantages in a sustainable manner. So this particular point we had highlighted uh, in the beginning. In the backdrop of globalization, many of the developing countries are involved in maximizing the growth strategy without exploring the possibilities of raising the non-resource driven component. Um, sometimes the purchase of technology is extremely costly. So they have given up uh, um, the, um, the methods of, of innovating or, or um, importing the technology rather they are uh, initiating the, um, the resource intensive uh, growth path. Hence the growth story and the TFPG tra trajectories may not match in many of these developing countries. Labor productivity uh, growth, which is in fact much more directly observable and can be closely related to the overall growth experience of the countries can then be assessed in relation to TFPG. So uh, some of the critiques of TFPG suggest that factor productivity is not all that useless. Uh, particularly your labor productivity is a very useful concept and it can be directly, it is directly observable. So uh, one must uh, try to analyze the uh, trends in labor productivity. But at the same time, uh, your labor productivity can be extremely misleading because if you are pursuing um, uh, capital accumulation methods, then naturally labor productivity will be increasing very, very rapidly without really meaning that a particular individual is contributing more compared to what he was doing in the past. So in other words, whether the non-resource driven growth component is translating itself to labor productivity growth or the latter is growing more independently using up the existing resource space. So if labor productivity is growing because of capital accumulation processes or because of more resource intensive methods, then you can find that there can be a strong divergence between labor productivity growth and total factor productivity. If labor productivity is grow growth is taking place because of actual contribution made by the uh, human resource, then there can be convergence between TFPG and labor productivity. On the other hand, if labor productivity is growing primarily because of using up of uh, enormous amount of capital, there can be strong divergence between these two indicators. Based on the intertemporal data for each of the countries, we observe that a number of countries registered either a negative or a positive, though low, correlation between labor productivity growth and TFPG growth. So the evidence doesn't support that both these indicators are moving in the same direction. Relatively fewer countries show a positive and medium or high correlation between the two variables. Evidently, countries are engaged in greater mechanization, which may be raising the labor productivity without ushering in much success in terms of total factor productivity growth. So you are able to identify a number of countries where labor productivity growth has taken place very significantly at a rapid pace, but total factor productivity growth has been very sluggish or has been negative or, or has been very moderate. So there is a lot of divergence. Dividing the time period into two phases, um, uh, uh, one of the tables, the, the next table indicates that most of the countries which showed a negative or weakly positive correlation between labor productivity growth and TFPG in the 90s continued to remain so in the 2000s as well. 
So it, there was no improvement between labor productivity and uh, growth and total factor productivity growth over the years. Even only a handful of countries graduated to uh, unfold a, a better association between these variables. So on the whole, the country's strategy to catch up in terms of growth does not seem to be based on resource saving approach, which is indeed a key to sustainable development. So one could argue that sustainable development is not uh, something that is taking place. Uh, so here we have uh, tried to divide all the countries in terms of the magnitude of correlation between labor productivity and total factor productivity growth. You can see a number of countries here uh, in, in, the, in this uh, first column, which represents a negative correlation between these two indicators. And even you have uh, many countries in this uh, column uh, depicting low correlation between labor productivity growth and TFPG growth. So only a few countries you are able to see, relatively few countries in the um, medium correlation zone and the high correlation zone. So this is again, uh, this, this the, uh, yeah, uh, continuation of that. Now we move on to the regression results for annual labor productivity growth uh, taken as a dependent variable. Um, so let me, so, and this exercise we are trying to do um, the uh, labor productivity is regressed on total factor productivity growth and patents. Okay. And this uh, regression, we are doing it for different regions separately for all countries, as well as for different regions. And since this is based on panel data, naturally we are adopting uh, the alternative techniques, the fixed effect and the random effect. And based on the Hossmann statistic, we are choosing the appropriate one. Okay, so let me uh, summarize. Uh, the, these tables will give you the results for different regions uh, apart from the uh, combined regression. So the regression results, which in addition to TFPG include the number of patents as a determinant of productivity are suggestive of the fact that patents is insignificant in the least developed countries and the low income countries, while it is significant in lower middle income upper middle income and high income countries. This is uh, pertaining to all countries pulled together. Region wise, we are able to see that the Latin American and Caribbean and South Asian countries, again, uh, unravel a significant impact of patents on labor productivity. TFPG on, uh, on uh, labor productivity, um, TFPG, on the other hand, is a significant determinant in a number of groups of countries, including the aggregate results, that is all countries combined. <clears throat> so it is only in case of Latin American and Caribbean, you are able to see this sort of a pattern. In terms of income, the least developed and low income countries and region wise, East Asia and Pacific, Middle East and North Africa, North America and Sub-Saharan African countries show TFPG as an insignificant determinant of labor productivity. So uh, we have repeated this, we have divided the countries as per income also. So one is region wise and also we have done it for um, across different uh, income groups. And in, in these categories, we are able to see that TFPG is insignificant. In other words, many of the countries in, re, uh, in, re, in regions largely corresponding to the developing world are not engaged in resource saving pursuits. The production processes in these countries adhere to resource intensive growth, which in future can pose serious challenges. Now we move on to uh, the, the last part of the analysis that is technology and employment. Is the modern technology itself averse to employment creation? In other words, effect of technology on employment is an important concern and whether technological growth tends to reduce employment or it can be conducive to employment growth is a pertinent issue. If technological development means lesser utilization of all the factors of production, then naturally labor will also be utilized uh, less and less with advancement in, uh, in technology. 
but if it reduces the utilization of some of the factors of production and not all, not labor, then both technology and employment can go hand in hand. So you can have technological advancement and also you can have rise in employment levels if the new technology does not necessarily reduce all the factors of production. In support of this view, it may be argued that output growth is faster than the growth of some of the inputs, such as capital, but not labor, because the labor contracts may involve rigidity. Labor might have been hired on a long-term basis, which can be treated as a sunk cost. Uh, a, re a retrospective cost that has already been incurred and cannot be recovered. Besides, the operation of the new technology is not necessarily automated, which involves labor displacement. So from that point of view, again, the new technology may also require labor, but in a different uh, incarnated form. So then the question comes up that how do you improve the employability, the skill levels of the workers? So the, uh, the debate then moves on uh, in a different direction. It would say that uh, the new technology may not uh, replace labor as such. It may replace the unskilled uh, labor. Uh, but if the uh, labor can be um, uh, made more employable, then uh, perhaps the new technology and employment can go hand in hand. A related point is also of great interest. Even if technology leads to lesser utilization of all the factors for a given level of output, the rise in the quantum of production of certainly of production certainly contributes to employment generation. This is what I was mentioning, the scale effect. So if uh, more number of firms are able to uh, come into the uh, e economic scene of a country, then naturally the scale effect will uh, take place and they will contribute to employment creation. Per unit, per enterprise, uh, employment may decline. But now, because there will be more number of firms, so the scale effect will contribute to the employment creation at the macro level. Modernization of technology may lead to its large-scale application in various sectors of the economy. And hence, the quantum of production and employment both may increase simultaneously, even when the new technology gets more capital intensive. And, uh, and and those points uh, that I was trying to highlight from uh, Viverelli's work. Though labor per unit of output may be declining in absolute terms, the increase in employment can still be sub substantial. These issues of employment increase at the aggregate level due to wider application of the advanced technology prompted by the profit, profit motive are certainly of great relevance particularly in the context of the developing economies confronted with the compulsion of maximizing growth and generating employment opportunities uh, for the vast supplies of labor. Um, another uh, point, uh, I don't know if I have mentioned it here. Um, yeah, uh, I have forgotten to mention it here. Another important point uh, I wanted to add here is that um, also many of the firms are enhancing their, uh, not just the scale of activities, they are enhancing their um, diversification processes. In other words, uh, the firm which was uh, specializing in the production of X only is now pursuing uh, production both in the areas of X and Y. Some of the byproducts which were sold to other firms or which were simply dumped now are being um, utilized by the firms in its new unit called the, um, the processing, the, called the uh, byproduct processing unit. So in, in these new uh, sectors, employment levels uh, are, are going up. Or the uh, employment retrenchment that has taken place in the main sector is being then uh, diverted to these new additional units that the firm is having. So this particular point we have uh, been able to verify from the company level data um, uh, for India. So in order to test this hypothesis, we have regressed log of employment uh, on log of value added and log of wage rate and the number of patents. Uh, the performance indicator is uh, uh, is taken in terms of TFPG and also TE alternately. 
So one set of regressions uh, is taken in terms of TFPG and another set in terms of TE is included to test if productivity growth or better utilization of resources results in higher output growth relative to input growth, including labor, or alternatively, it does not affect employment, though reduces the use of other inputs. So log of employment is regressed on log of value added, log of wage rate, the number of patents, and TFPG or TE, alternately. The results I presented here, again, we have given all countries combined results and also for different income groups, LDCs, low income, lower middle income, upper middle income, high income. And again, we have divided the countries region wise, East Asia and Pacific, Latin America, uh, et cetera. Middle East, uh, North America, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So what we are able to see based on panel data across countries, it is observed that the elasticity of employment with respect to value added is positive across regions and various income groups, though there are considerable variations in the magnitude. The same is true in relation to wage elasticity of employment. Our key variable here is your um, technology, which is proxied in terms of the outcome variable, that is TFPG or TE, and also we are considering patent. However, the impact of performance indicator TFPG is negligible in middle income countries, region wise in North America. It is important to note that none of the groups, income or region wise, recorded a statistically significant negative effect of TFPG on employment while the significant cases reveal a positive association. Significant cases are very few, but nevertheless, the significant cases reveal a positive association and the uh, negative cases are not statistically significant. However, the effect of patents, wherever statistically significant is seen to reduce employment when countries are divided as per income groups. On the other hand, different regions uh, decipher different uh, differential impact. East Asia and Pacific, North America and South Asia are indicative of a negative effect, while Europe and Central Asia, Latin America and Caribbean and Middle East and North Africa show a positive impact of patents on employment. So patent is showing a mixed effect, but the outcome variable TFPG, at least the negative cases are not statistically significant. As we replace TFPG by TE, technical efficiency, the effect of performance index remains mixed. Lower middle income and high income countries show a positive and negative effect respectively. So coming to the conclusion, productivity convergence is not evident among some of the groups of countries. Um, uh, for example, among the least developed countries, the long-term pace of decline in the variation is mild, though the humps of the early 90s and late 90s and early 2000s were not repeated thereafter. So my productivity smoothing has taken place, uh, but uh, still uh, income-wise, when you are dividing the countries, the least developed countries do not show very strong tendencies of convergence. Similarly, in the case of low income countries, again, the cross country variation in TFPG seems to have become less volatile in the 2000s, though the extent of long term decline in the sigma um, is, is uh, mild. Um, on the other hand, among the lower middle income, upper middle income and high income countries, the drop in the sigma magnitude is prominent. Looking at the sigma value after dividing the countries across regions, East Asia and Pacific, Europe and Central Asian and Latin American and Caribbean countries seem to have registered a steady fall, indicating convergence in the productivity growth experience of the countries in these regions. This could be attributed to a greater degree of association of countries in a given region. And maybe these countries are pursuing jointly the infrastructural ventures ICT coverage and advancement, trade negotiations, technology acquisition, and innovation and inflow of FDI. In terms of efficiency estimates, for select years, most of the countries are seen to be operating much below the frontier, 
which will confirm the fact that they are all pursuing resource driven growth and not really resource saving growth based on the intertemporal data for each of the countries we observe that a number of countries registered either a negative or a positive correlation between labor productivity growth and tfpg growth which again confirms that the rise in labor productivity is resulting primarily from capital um, accumulation processes uh, <clears throat> Evidently, countries are engaged in greater mechanization, which may, may be raising the labor productivity without really uh, resulting in marked success in overall uh, total. From panel data, it is observed that the elasticity of employment with respect to value added is positive across regions, as well as various income groups, though there are considerable variations in the magnitude. The same is true in relation to wage elasticity. However, the impact of technology, which is perceived in terms of the performance indicator TFPG is negligible uh, in most of the cases. But it is important to note that none of the groups income or region wise recorded a statistically significant and negative effect of TFPG on employment. So this is what we say as the silver lining. While the significant cases reveal a positive association. Hence, we may infer that modern technology is not necessarily employment saving in absolute sense, at least. The scale effect may exist. The, the processing of byproducts, as I was uh, telling you, um, which we have verified in terms of uh, Indian company level data, can uh, create more em new employment opportunities. And hence, uh, for the uh, firm, uh, shifting can take place. and. Uh, uh, the overall decline may not be realized. So appropriate incentives may motivate firms to experience both technological progress and employment growth. So now we need to reflect on what kind of incentives will uh, motivate firms to experience both technological progress and employment growth. Now, uh, the literature has talked about um, tax benefits to be given to the firms, uh, uh, which are pursuing um, innovative um, methods or which are initiating a lot of research and development expenditure. Also, I mentioned to you that some of these figures are completely fake. And uh, the so in what way uh, the incentives can be given on the one hand and at the same time, the firms can be penalized for showing uh, wrong records are, are sort of important questions. If you have any question. Thank you very much, sir. I think uh, Dr. S. Krishna Kumar has raised his hand. Can we ask a question, sir? Okay. Dr. Kumar? Dr. Krishna Kumar? Okay. Uh, Daisy, Daisy Kumari. Dr. Daisy, you have uh, some uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, it's my pleasure to hear you again. Uh, my question is how to increase the productivity in uh, rural sector through advancement of technology? Yes, uh, very important question. Uh, that We are able to see that uh, the, the farms which are located in very large cities are able to experience um, uh, rapid uh, uh, productivity growth compared to the uh, farms which are located in the remote areas. Now, um, one... Um, mechanism through which uh, farms in different uh, spaces or different locations can be connected is your ICT. So ICT coverage will have, because the new technology is coming in the form of ICT. So if the ICT coverage can be enhanced, uh, the bandwidth can be improved in the rural areas, then technology dissemination can be faster. <laughs> One aspect of the story. The other is that uh, productivity depends on internal factors as well as the external factors. The, particularly the agglomeration literature will suggest that uh, the external factors are very, very important. So in case, suppose you try to divide the external factors into certain categories. One is the physical infrastructure, financial infrastructure, and the social infrastructure. Then we must realize that the physical, all these three indicators are very, very low in the rural areas. So the, the state will have to initiate greater investment in terms of physical, financial, and social infrastructure in the rural areas, which then can help farms to catch up 
with the with their counterparts located in the urban areas. Thank you, sir. So, can I ask the question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it was a very long, exhaustive presentation. So, might be uh, uh, we will have to read the paper before we ask the questions. But may I uh, ask certain questions to you because yeah. you've been working on total factor productivity. I wondered your reflections on how. The total factor productivity has there been any develop any developments with respect to the calculations associated with total factor productivity, which directly accounts for the environmental bats which are coming because the productivity of right. firms or productivity right. of economies right. might be on the upswing, but Absolutely. it might be because of environmental bats. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, there are two or three questions, so I will just raise all these questions and whatsoever you feel is possible, right. you could. Right. Right. Number Absolutely. two. Whenever we are having this total factor productivity debates, there has been periods in 50s to 70s when we said that the TFPs have been on the rise worldwide. And from 70s, we have been saying that it has been on the decline. And now again, we are saying that it has been on the decline, like how your study yeah. is trying to say. Is it because some new technologies, when they're basically in the initial stages right. of getting incorporated Absolutely. in the firms, it actually weighs up in the form of uh, larger capital and therefore too, is it because of right. that, that this tendency is there? And if I, uh, if I heard you right, you were saying that, see, the IT capital cost or the IT labor cost has been on the increase and this could be a possible reason for the TFP decrease. And if that is so, uh, why should it not be a positive development? Because at least some subsegment of the labor has been able to appropriate to itself some amount of some amount of their own productivity improvements, hmm. or is it that I'm getting it wrong? That is it then no, that I'll, for TFP increases, uh, the I'll, labor I'll, I'll is not I'll, able I'll, to appropriate all of their productivity improvements, then only right. overall the TFP in the economy will increase. Please be very frank that I might be totally wrong in what I have heard. So, so please correct you know, me also. I'll, 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 yeah. yeah, these are the three, yeah, I think these are the three, yeah. Okay. See, on the environmental uh, point, of course, uh, people to uh, introduce uh, environment as an additional factor and compute total factor productivity growth by, by accounting for the um, uh, environment, which is treated as an additional factor. Now, in these calculations, of course, uh, frankly speaking, I have not done that. Because from the UNIDO data set, the kind of information which you have is not possible to do that kind of an exercise. Uh, but uh, conceptually, it is very much possible, uh, particularly for a given country, if not for all the countries, for a given country, it should be possible. And when you are calculating the productivity across space uh, within a given country, large cities, medium-sized city, cities, small towns, rural areas, etc., it should be possible. Um, you impute a, a implicit price for the environment, and you sort of try to then uh, uh, work out that what is the environmental cost that is uh, getting uh, that is entering into the production process. So when you are have you have the value added function, you are you, when you are having the output function, you have taken capital, labor, material, energy. So now in addition to these four factors of production, you also consider the uh, environmental cost, and then one should be able to compute the total factor productivity growth. Of course, it will be more difficult uh, because what kind of shadow price you will use for that, et cetera. But nevertheless, theoretically, it is possible. And some of the studies have already initiated with these methods. Your second question uh, was uh, related to this, this uh, uh, the second, uh, I'm forgetting TFP this. Slow, TFP slowdowns and upswings, the cycles of TFP slowdowns and upswings. Yes, the TFPG slowdown. The TFPG slowdown, uh, yes, you are absolutely right that uh, ICT um, has already reached a boom. Similarly, technological progress has reached a boom and uh, people are waiting uh, for another boom to happen. So which will perhaps uh, bring in uh, technological advancement and which will contribute to total factor productivity growth. So historically, what we are able to see that as and when a new te technology has come in, that has contributed to total factor productivity growth. And if there is not a continuous um, progress, then there is some amount of stagnancy that has happened. 
So, um, so what Solo had uh, mentioned way back in the 60s that, uh, techn that technical progress is the key to total factor productivity growth is, is very, very important. So if the uh, advanced countries are not able to pursue the technological progress in a continuous manner, there can be certain phases where uh, you will be able to see stagnancy. And at the same time, the emerging economies, we had thought that through their exporting, promotion of exporting industries, labor intensive exporting industries will be able to um, reduce the um, capital cost, et cetera, but that has not happened. So that is why they are also not able to experience very rapid productivity growth. Rather, they are pursuing mechanized methods and they are using up their resources. As a result, uh, you get to see that the total factor productivity growth is sluggish, though labor productivity is increasing fast. Your third question relates to that at least um, some of the employees are benefiting in the process. Yes, the question is that uh, usually the urban economists will argue that if your uh, total factor productivity growth is taking place, then part of the productivity growth can actually be transmitted, uh, can be shared with the employees. So some of the employees will benefit um, the theory would, of course, suggest that all the employees would benefit and the wage rate will also uh, go up for all the workers. Uh, in reality, what we are able to see that uh, there is uh, more wage inequality, that uh, people who are highly skilled, they, uh, they are able to get a larger share in the productivity gain. But those who are at the, uh, at the lower echelons, uh, they, the, the blue collar job holders are not really able to get a larger share in the Again, or in other words, their wage increase is not very, very rapid. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is fine. And those who are engaged in the ICT sector, etc., they are able to experience an uh, improvement. So from that point of view, one can argue that at least productivity growth has benefited some of the workers, um, some of the employees. Uh, but the other point which uh, relates to that the technological advancement the technological advancement and your um, ICT advancement are sort of, both are interconnected. So technological advancement will not be possible unless ICT advancement is, taking, is going to take place. So that is the reason why the world is still waiting for another uh, new boom to take place in the ICT industry. Thank you so much. Question. Um, Dr. Thank you. Please remind me your third question. The third question, I think you have indirectly answered the IT thing. Oh. IT, you have answered now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Ashwan, this was had a question. Manirvan, you want to ask your question or should I read it? Anirvan? Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, so thank you for this nice presentation. Uh, so my uh, just I I, I only have a one question uh, that is you are talking about uh, in in globalized world uh, that uh, uh, we are we we can assume that the technology frontier would be same for uh, all the countries or across the countries. But it is uh, uh, there are many barriers. For example, trade barriers or access to different kinds of technologies. Uh, so how do you uh, suggest to incorporate uh, those issues uh, when we uh, will be at, we will be you know uh, aiming for such kind of study. Right. Uh, In fact, the trade barriers can be very strong. Even if you assume theoretically that all tra trade barriers will be removed in the context of uh, um, globalization, there are other factors which will not allow the uh, farms in the developing countries to catch up with the farms in the developed world particularly when you take recourse to the external economies of scale. The, ex the external um, factors which uh, result in agglomeration benefits may not be same. The, uh, the environment under which uh, the new technology was innovated and is to be utilized may not uh, find a friendly atmosphere in the developing world. Similarly, the kind of infrastructure it requires may not be available in the developing world. The human capital the uh, one of the uh, theories would suggest that the human capital which is required to operate the new technology is not usually available in the developed world and that is the reason why it is the same technology is not uh, resulting in uh, equal levels of productivity uh, 
in we had in fact with the unido data we had tried to do a, a, a frontier function analysis at a given point in time and just cross sectional data and we were trying to see uh, that uh, Um, yes, I will share my PPT and uh, and the, we were trying to uh, see that whether most of the developing countries are at par with the developed countries or not. And interestingly, or rather sadly, we could see that the developing countries operation level was much lower than that of the developed countries. So you are presuming that the same technology is available for both the worlds but the developing country firms are not able to exploit that technology optimally. So that proves the, uh, the fact that there are many, many factors which will actually impinge on your productivity performance or uh, total factor productivity as well as uh, technical efficiency. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Uh, I think we can uh... Any more questions? I just see the chat. Rama, I will send you the PPTs as well as the paper. Yes, sir. Yeah, we will circle it. And uh, yeah. but, so Sangeeta had a question. If you can take one last question, Sangeeta Mondal, uh, if you are there, you can ask it directly or uh, should I? Uh -huh. Actually, uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Actually, sir has already answered my question when uh, uh, answering uh, Dr. Biswas' uh, uh, question about that human capital. I just wanted to ask that how to incorporate human capital in the calculation of, you know, uh, productivity and technical efficiency because, uh, you know, technology needs a... Uh, yes. Um, actually, uh, how yes. you in, introduce human capital is a very important consideration that, uh, in fact, uh, it can be do in, uh, it can be done in two different ways that um, while you are using a production function approach, you can take uh, different types of uh, human capital and uh, you can work out the contribution of different types of human capital to productivity growth. That is one approach. The other is you estimate the total factor productivity growth um, in a crude way. And then in the second stage, you try to look at the total factor productivity growth with the human capital formation index and try to see if there is a close connection between them. Okay, okay, thank you, sir, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Has he left? I think either there's some technical issue or he's left the meeting. So, uh, participants, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope. Uh, today was a very technical uh, session. I think both the three thirty and uh, the five o'clock one. And uh, uh, you, you are free to ask any questions on uh, the respective email IDs we have provided. And uh, thank you so much. Have a very good night, so that we can meet in the morning fresh again. <laughs> uh, thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you, ma'am.